Um, so welcome to ATSI's Victorian Vision panel discussion this evening, the science behind vaccines, Australia's capacity for large-scale fermentation production of biologics. This is a very interesting discussion to be having this evening, and we're very grateful um, to our panellists who have come and join us, who represent a variety of different interests in the scaling of biological um, processes and in vaccine production. We have everything from the, the front end design and then the scale up uh, to the, the, the end point, which is what are the user needs for vaccines and how do we roll them out. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So it's my great delight to introduce the panellists. The agenda for this evening is that each of the four panellists will give a 10 minute presentation and then we will go to a panel discussion where you will have the opportunity to ask them questions. So our first panellist for this evening is Dr. Nicole van der Wiek Beden. She's the Executive Director and CEO of Hexena Limited. Hexena is a biological company, biotechnology company, engaged in the research and development of plant-derived defence and peptides for applications as human therapeutics. Its lead product candidate, HXP124, applied in a topical formulation, is a potential new biological prescription treatment for terminal fungal infections. Hexema is currently conducting an Australian Phase 2B trial, clinical trial of HXP124 for um, fungal terminal infections. I know there's a technical name for that, Nicole, and I'll allow you to pronounce it because I'm not going to try. <laughs> <laughs> but, you've got you got the, the cameras in front of you. The cameras yeah. behind you. No, no, no. That's yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to the production crew. We really appreciate that. Um, manufacture of a new drug substance is a critical step in the drug development process. Access to quality fermentation capacity at a range of scales to facilitate process development and production of drug substances for toxicology and clinical studies is crucial for Australian biotechnology companies to successfully develop new products. Hexema was able to utilise microbial fermentation capacity in Australia for the early stages of development. However, it needed to move overseas to the facilities for later stage development due to a lack of capacity in Australia. Dr. Nicole van der Beden um, completed her PhD in biochemistry at La Trobe University in 2007. Her PhD research on antifungal properties and mechanisms of action of plant defences led to the award of a prestigious Victoria Fellowship in 2006. Since completing her PhD, Nicole has worked for Hexema Limited and has led the discovery and development program for novel peptide therapeutics for fungal infections. Nicole holds an MBA from the Melbourne Business School. Welcome, Nicole. consumer-driven market. So some of you uh, may recognize this infected sort of toenail up here. Uh, it's the, the fungal nail infection affects about 14% of the population, more prevalent uh, as people get older. Uh, there's a very strong consumer preference to use topical products uh, to treat a fungal nail infection rather than systemic uh, antifungal drug, drugs, but the topical products just aren't very effective. You need to use them for a year and they have very low efficacy rates. Applying them every day, you know, the, your clearance rate uh, is still less than 20% uh, even for the best topical products. So there's a clear unmet medical need there for patients to have an effective topical product. Um, we are developing uh, HXP124, which is a, a novel and unique um, antifungal molecule. And importantly, for today's discussion, it's actually a biologic uh, and it's that definitely the first biologic to be developed to treat fungal nail infections and one of the first being developed for a dermatology and topical indication. Um, we have a strong patent position uh, and a long patent life. 
So this is a, a plus. Um, we are now, importantly, the, the three main attributes that we see for our drug is that it's safe, it's convenient, and it's effective. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, each of those in a couple of slides, um, but just to note here, it's a, an easy to apply, you know, brush it on your nail, and you only need to use it for six weeks uh, rather than uh, like the current products are all daily therapy for 48 weeks or a year. Uh, and we see very rapid clearing of the nail. Uh, so patients can see their nail clearing quickly. They want to use it. Uh, it helps with patient compliance and it's quite effective. Uh, we see um, sort of best in class cure rates in the clinical data that we've got to date. So we've conducted a phase one, two way uh, clinical trial for this uh, drug already, and we found it's very safe and well tolerated. We didn't see any adverse events. We didn't see any redness, irritation, and importantly, it's not absorbed into the bloodstream, so there were no systemic uh, toxicity issues as well. So um, we're very confident that HSP 124 is a very safe molecule. And again, um, part of the reason behind, behind that is it's a biologic, it's a larger molecule, you know, the body um, has a, a fairly uh, well-defined processes, obviously, for, for breaking down peptides and things. You don't tend to see the same off-target effects uh, that you sometimes see in small molecules. Um, we saw, this is just a little bit of, of data uh, on our efficacy. So there's two main measures of I'll show you, we, we looked at mycological cure, so just clearing of the fungus from the nail, uh, and that was assessed by microscopy and culture. And we saw 52% uh, of our HXP124 treated nails were culture and stain negative uh, versus 23% for the vehicle. Uh, and this is sort of best in class cure rates and around two-fold higher than the current treatments uh, at that same point, despite the very short treatment duration. Uh, and if we look at actual sort of visible clearing of the nail, again, we saw this really nice trend over the duration of our study uh, that the, the nail, the affected nail area was clearing. Uh, and this just looks at the number of nails, the number of, yeah, number of infected nails that had cleared to the point that less than 10% of the nail was infected. So we saw this continuing trend uh, for clear nail growing through and the infected nail area was growing out. Uh, all good dermatology drugs make pictures in their presentations. Uh, and you can see here, you know, that you've got this infected area here, uh, and that is clearing very nicely in these treated nails. So a little bit about why um, HXP124 is, is unique uh, and lends itself so well to treating this disease. Uh, it's a very good antifungal molecule, it's a plant defensin. So it's evolved in plants as part of the innate immune system to specifically target fungal pathogens very well. It's uh, a really soluble, hydrophilic and highly soluble molecule. Uh, and that's really important for its ability to actually get through the nail. Um, the nail is quite hydrophilic, you have a shower and absorbs water and it goes all soft. All of the current topical treatments are these small molecule hydrophobic antifungal drugs and they just can't penetrate that environment. Um, and obviously it's regulated as a biologic because uh, it's a peptide and, and that will lead me on to the relevant part of my discussion today. So there's been a real trend towards biologic drugs. A lot of that's driven by monoclonal antibodies uh, and a whole host of reasons. But if you look at the data, this is FDA approvals since 1993 um, and the number of BLAs in purple, so biological license applications versus new chemical entities in green. Uh, and this trend line here is just the proportion of biologic drugs. So um, the, number, the number and proportion of, of biological drugs is uh, increasing over time. And that's because biologics have some uh, important features. They're obviously larger than small molecule drugs, up to 150 kilodaltons for you know, antibody type drugs. Uh, their larger size enables them, there's much more complexity to them, right? Just the, the chemical space uh, that they occupy is much larger, uh, leading to greater complexity. And that allows them to have much better target specificity, usually much larger areas of interaction with their target. Um, and that then tends to uh, mean that there's less off-target effects uh, that you can get for small molecules. 
Um, for their manufacture, uh, they need to be produced in a recombinant expression system, and that can be a little more complex than the chemical synthesis, often used for small molecules, uh, and obviously requires some unique infrastructure. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about our experience uh, with the microbial fermentation uh, yeast in particular. Uh, so there's usually uh, recombinant production in bacteria, yeast, insect cells, mammalian cells, there's a few others, but these are the main ones. Um, and microbial fermentation, uh, and in particular yeast, has a few benefits. It's very fast, uh, it's cheap, uh, the yields are typically higher than what you see with mammalian fermentation. Um, it's not so good with post-translational modifications, but that is not an issue for us and, and for a lot of drugs. So there, there is a trend, I think, uh, towards moving towards the yeast um, expression system as a really cost-effective way to produce biologics. Uh, and we were lucky in that HXP124 is uh, very is able to be produced uh, at really high levels and a really efficient cost in yeast fermentation. Uh, and so this is we use a, a non-proprietary yeast expression system. Uh, this is just some photos of our, uh, our current 3,000 litre scale facilities in Europe. Uh, this is our upstream processing fermentation tank and our, our downstream uh, processing for the 3,000 litre scale. And that's all done to GMP manufacturing uh, conditions. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what we've been able to do here in Australia uh, and then what we've had to go offshore for, but in particular the scale up. Um, and our, our, we're very lucky in that our, our molecule is very stable, um, which is not always the case for biologics. So for Hexima, uh, it's been a, a long and interesting scale-up journey. So I think this scale-up is, is fairly consistent across most drugs uh, in that you start at small scale, non-GMP, right, GMP being good manufacturing practice. Um, and that's for you know early process development, material for formulation work, and some early toxicology studies. You then generally need to, to move to a larger scale in order to produce material for pivotal toxicology mm -hmm. studies, uh, which generally require much more material. Uh, and then leading on to GMP, your early GMP manufacturing, which is producing material that can be used by humans and therefore for your early clinical studies. Um, we can do this non-GMP sort of 10 litre scale in-house, uh, although we also did some work with a, a contract manufacturer here in Australia. We were able to do this non-GMP and GMP at, at medium scale uh, in Australia with a, a company called Luina Bio up in Brisbane. They're the only, um, well, at the time, and I think still are the only company uh, that would do that scale of GMP manufacturing. Um, but at that point, well, we, so this was the material for our phase one clinical study, uh, and now we're doing our phase two B clinical study looking towards phase three and commercial scale, and we really needed to get up to sort of three to 5,000 litre scale um, because you need to be within sort of tenfold scale of your commercial production. Uh, and this is the point where we uh, needed to move offshore. Uh, we've gone to Europe. There's a, a lot of manufacturing facilities in Europe um, because there wasn't the capacity here in Australia to do that. So um, instead of being able to do this to sort of one smooth scale up process with the one manufacturer, uh, we had to do a check transfer at this point. And so transfer the, the method from one manufacturer to another. Um, and that was sort of time consuming and expensive. Um, and obviously, you know, one of the downsides of uh, working in Europe is the, the time zone issues. And other than convenience, it does create a, a lag, right? That, you know, we hear about something on a early in the morning that's happened the day before there. And then by the time we get a response to that, we've really lost the day uh, in being able to implement any changes you might want to do. Um, and that can be, you know, quite important when, you know, these, these runs are usually completed in a week. Uh, so you want to be able to really rapidly um, optimize them. And obviously that uh, lack, particularly during COVID, we haven't been able to go and visit that site. You know, Zoom is very effective, but it's not the same as sitting there and learning from, from people. I don't know that that's had too much of an impact on our, our process and our outcome, but it certainly has limited, I think, the learning that our team has been able to achieve uh, and bring back, um, you know, to Australia in terms of that 
um, experience. Uh, so just in summary, uh, I won't go through all of these, but you know, biological drugs uh, are a really good source of, of new therapies. Uh, we've got limited capacity here in Australia, particularly for microbial fermentation at large scale, um, and obviously moving offshore adds complexity. It would be great if we had some more infrastructure here to be able to uh, do some more. And that's just a thank you slide. So much, Nicole. Um, and I'd just like to remind those on Zoom that you can ask any questions using the QA function, and that we can, we're accepting those now. If you have any burning questions you'd like to ask us, please. Our next panelist is Professor Bruce Thompson, who's the Dean of Health Science at Swinburne University. He's regarded as an international expert on clinical respiratory measurement. He's the current president of the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand the first non-medical president in the history of the society. And in this capacity, Professor Thompson has had a significant role in the COVID pandemic, especially as many within the respiratory medicine profession have been working on the front line. Professor Thompson's strengths are his rare combination of experience in computational and experimental clinical respiratory physiology, combined with clinical laboratory measurement and testing, allowing the translation of basic science into routine clinical testing. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks so much for the invitation. And I'll stand back here because otherwise you'll see my double chin on the, uh, on the, on the video. We don't want to see that. So I must stand back even further, actually. Um, uh, look, I've been invited to give a sort of an interesting talk in, in that it's uh, talking about biologics and the use of asthma, which is obviously very dear to my heart and the profession and what we do, but also partly my role in. Uh, the COVID story, I suppose, federally associated with the with the um, uh, the TSA and ZEP, but also in terms of vaccines and what I know. And I was also talked about can you put some of the myth busters up? Um, and there've been some corpus, but I'll just talk about the basic stuff first. So, as I mentioned, two conditions: asthma and COPD, where the, um, two major drugs in terms of biologics and vaccines, obviously critically important for us to be able to move forward. And the camera's just lost altogether as well. I'm not touching it. <laughs> That'll be just far too vulgar. Um, so what is asthma? If you're looking at it from a physiological point of view, which I am, uh, which is not necessarily the right way because we actually went down that wrong rabbit hole, it's basically a condition of the feed into large airways. Anyone who has asthma in this room will talk about that the airways are constricted and it's probably due to the squeezed muscle constricting these airways, leading to uh, inflammation of that airway and then basically makes it really hard for you to breathe and 10% of these people in this room will have asthma and have puffers of some form. So, but the problem with that is if we just look at, if we're looking at it, this is the condition, I'm going to use drugs, they're going to be looking on the smooth muscle. So drugs that are going to relax the smooth muscle or drugs that are going to basically decrease the amount of inflammation that the, that's been produced around this area. So that's sort of okay, and it works for a little while, but at the end of the day, um, this is the problem. People still die of asthma every year, and it's avoidable. And I have a big problem with that, that people actually die who didn't need to. It drives me absolutely crazy. People actually roll up to, we have the highest mortality in the world, in Australia, of asthma. And we have some of the best medical care in the, in the world as well. How, how can we reconcile those two? So we've had a lot of, uh, you know, things like uh, short-acting beta agonists, long-acting beta agonists, and pale steroids, combination therapy, and it really has an effect at the severe end of the scale. And the problem with the severe unstable asthma patients, they have a higher mortality, higher morbidity, increase in costs, and this is just not sustainable. So even though we do have some really good treatments, they're not really working at the severe end of the, uh, of the scale. We need to start thinking about this condition, not as a set of airways, but as a basically an inflammatory condition and an immunological condition. This is hard for me to say mm -hmm. as, a, um, as a sort of a physical scientist having to talk about immunology. Um, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really important that we need to do that. The other thing is this is some data from Andrew Tai, and he was a uh, his respiratory physician, pediatric physician in Adelaide, but was based here in Melbourne at the Children's Hospital. And this is some data that was collected in a longitudinal study for almost 50 years of a group of people who started as seven-year-olds 
and then now they're in their 50s. And this is a mark of airflow obstruction, how hard it is to blow out. And normal is around about this line and above. So we've got normal people here and then various degrees of asthma. So children at the age of 10 have airflow obstruction and the definition for COPD or emphysema is that number less than 70. So by the age of 14 and above, you've got a bunch of people who now have emphysema and COPD. But what's kind of interesting, these lines are just very parallel and really nothing has changed. In the advent of this, we've had short-acting bleeder agonists, long-acting bleeder agonists, inhaled corticotherapy, combination therapies, and nothing's changing. So what are I going to do for a child to go from there to there because we know they're going to follow that path? So we have to think of other types of drugs, and this is where um, we're going to start thinking about biological agents. So if you have a person with severe asthma, you've treated all their comorbidities, make sure they take their drugs, kind of handy. Um, and then we need to start phenotyping. Let's actually look at the type of inflammatory process that they have. Because when we do that, we know the immunology, and this is all alphabet soup to me. It almost looks like an Australian in my mind. But what actually the good thing about it is these, these various pathways that leads to mast cell degranulation and inflammation. So it could be IgE, it could be IL-5, IL-13. Each one of these lead to the inflammatory process. We can even look at other ones here, IL-25 and 33, which are potentially actually other pathways that we can specifically target. And as Nicole mentioned just before, the good thing about biological agents is we can just take that, that one out. So amalizumab, that's probably one of the first biologic agents that actually came out and was on the PBS. Dupilumab looks after IL-13, that's just been listed on the PLA, um, PBS. Gramalizumab is also been around for a little while um, and is just starting to get some traction and there's some new drugs here, plus other types of MABs that other pharmaceutical companies are coming up with. So this is kind of cool because we can actually wipe out actually the immunological pathway with particular therapy. So why is this important? Back to some data again about the prevalence of asthma. One in 10 people have asthma in this country. It's actually one in nine, it's getting to now. If you look at it, India, it's one in 14. Poorly controlled, it's um, uh, only one in 10 people have poor controlled asthma. I can't accept that. That keeps me awake all night, thinking only one in 10 people have their asthma controlled. We have to be able to do better. Um, in terms of severity, 20% have uh, severe asthma and they're 80% of the cost. 400 people needlessly die every year with this particular condition and 90% of the hospital admissions associated with asthma were totally avoidable. Now, could you imagine a doc rolling up and just say, sorry you're in here, didn't I realise this is totally avoidable if we actually did this, this and this? You know, we have to change the language and we have to take this seriously. So that's the asthma story where biological agents can fit in and this is brand new, last three or four years. Unfortunately, they're $30,000 a year and they require injections. So we need to do a little bit more work on it because they've been highly effective. I think everyone in this room has heard of COVID, so we probably don't need to talk about it a whole lot. Sort of, um, this is actually really old data. These numbers came from two days ago. Um, so total cases are about 116 and a half million cases across the globe now. And it's sadly killed two and a half million people, which has a mortality of about 2.2%. That's pretty high for a virus. And I think if I said to you, look, you've just been diagnosed with this, you have a 2.2% chance of dying, it'd freak you out. So with influenza, it sits around about 0.9% or less. Still, influenza in 2019 killed 800 people in this country. So very high mortality for a virus, but it's nothing like a bowl which kills everyone. So it's still classified as a mild virus, um, kind of weird, still mild. Um, it's not Ebola, it's not smallpox. And so far, we've given 300 million vaccines uh, so far across globally, and believe it or not, they're working. So this is a little bet that I have. If we look at the um, Australian curve, we've seen that. We have these two waves. Unfortunately, in Victoria, we took the run of the second wave. Um, the other states don't look anything like this, but clearly that second wave is due to us in Victoria, due to a not so funny comedy of errors of how the outbreak happened. But let's have a look at healthcare workers because these are a bunch of people on the front line. And in the middle of the second wave, this is some data published out of Royal Melbourne Hospital and the NJA, 
it was almost 10% of all infections occurring in Victoria were due to were actually the healthcare workers. The problem with that is it wipes out the whole industry in one hit. So Frankston Hospital, 70% of the staff were furloughed, so it almost closed the whole hospital. A um, little bit higher early on, um, number of outbreaks, but overall it's about 9.1%. So, and part of the reasons were, were and still believe to be a case of breakdown in PPE, it's actually, um, uh, PPE is actually hard. And you may have heard me on television talking about wearing a mask is like wearing your underwear on your face, you know, don't touch it. Um, don't put it in your pocket, don't give it to somebody else. Um, so, because it's infected. And so people would pull that, you know, gown up, walk out of the COVID ward and then go down to the cafeteria and then buy something to eat. It just infected everybody along the line. So they became a little complacent. The other thing is if you have one case of TB in a hospital, it freaks them out. We had 54 cases at the Royal Melbourne Hospital with the one condition that was more contagious than TB. So we had this reservoir of virus, which is a big problem. The staff were just getting tired because half of them were furloughed. Um, testing was a bit of a problem because we had a lot of undiagnosed cases because we weren't testing enough. We really needed spotters to make sure before you downed up, you basically need to know what you're doing. And then staff were working across multiple sites. And I've got a friend of mine who was working on the front line and she was actually had to sign a contract that she could be with a family. And it had to be actually totally independent of everyone going to China sites, which is difficult. So if we look at a bunch of healthcare infections in Edinburgh or Melbourne Hospital, um, mostly female, mostly in the nursing staff. And the nice thing about it, if it's called nice, the large majority of the very mild illness, about 89%. But sadly, a few people landed themselves in intensive care or hospital in the home, no deaths, but this is a CT scan from a 30-year-old woman who uh, this is what she was left with after 35 days of uh, intensive care. And so this is something that's going to be a respiratory cripple. I'm um, just saying, so you know, this stuff here, that's not right. That's just shocking. So for us, it'd be really clear. Um, so we need to vaccinate. I actually looked at went on to this photo. I reckon he's going, I don't like this. Yeah. This hurts. So, um, but I'm reading and bearing it, so it's fantastic. This is a problem. This, all these slides here are available on the, on the government website. So the total transparency, but this is the problem. We're a pretty big country. And I think Robinson River is sitting around here. That's about 1,800 kilometres south um, east of Darwin. How are we going to vaccinate? How are we going to be able to distribute across all these people? And hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about it. But if we know the nature of these vaccines, we're going to be cold and all this stuff. How are we going to roll these things out? It's a massive problem. So we're in this phase here, we're planning to vaccinate the best part of 700,000 people, that's 1.4 million doses. This 1B is still up for discussion of when it's going to start and what does it actually mean. So now if you have, say, my children's age in the 20s, where they're looking here, that's probably going to happen next year now. I think probably how it will pan out. So, uh, and that's just supply. How, how do we physically just vaccinate that many people. We also have a really interesting problem. We have, Australia has only 112 cases of COVID at the moment. So we're vaccinating a country that doesn't have any COVID. Um, whereas every other country is getting vaccinated really with COVID. So all our questions are in reverse, which is kind of interesting. So uh, some myths. Uh, RNA vaccines, can they get into your DNA and stay there? Uh, no, completely different mechanism at all. So don't need to worry about that. Which medical group qualifies for 1B? This is one of the ones that's been kicking around for a while. At this stage, there's no advice at this point in time. Uh, I take drugs and in, in, I have rheumatoid arthritis. I would like to be in that 1B group if I possibly can, but at the end of the day, do I need to be? And will I qualify? That's still yet to be decided. And it's a big thing for patients with asthma uh, and COPD and IPF and all that sort of stuff. How do we get into this 1B group? Um, where will I get my vaccine? Hopefully, we'll get them mostly from your GPs. There are some hubs and hospitals floating around, but most likely it's going to be from your GP, especially if it doesn't require the cold storage like the AstraZeneca one does. Will I get a choice? No, not at all. Please don't go there. Um, and uh, which is better? Please don't go there either. Um, but 
Uh, this is the latest that came out of from uh, um, when I spoke to Paul Kelly the other day. The AstraZeneca vaccine is looking good. So uh, I put it down to Coke versus Pepsi, uh, Holden versus Ford, Mercedes versus BMW, depending. Um, basically, they're still cars and they still get you there and they're all fine. So, um, and I think the press releases and the information and how it's been sensationalized is just not on. These are very good vaccines and way better than an influenza vaccine that we have at the moment. What about new variants? We don't have any data at this stage, but the existing vaccines are looking okay. Um, good, maybe it's okay. Um, and the construct of potentially getting um, revaccinated every year is still definitely on the cards, very similar to what we do for influenza. And then what about transmission? So what do we do about this? We don't know. Um, however, what we do know is if you've been vaccinated, then you uh, ultimately decrease your viral load, so therefore it's less likely you're going to transmit it. That's in theory at the moment, and that seems to be how it's panning out. Also, there's about a 60% less chance of you actually contracting the virus as well. So that's what we sort of know. So I think in terms of two scales of the scale of asthma and the scale of, um, of COVID, um, we don't make this stuff, but we need to. Um, and that's really it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Alex panelist is Professor Susie Nielsen, who is a biology group leader at CSIRO Biology Group Manufacturing Program. Professor Nielsen will speak about the CSIRO capacity for the development and optimization of the scale up process for the production of biologics. They will have a focus on using them for phase one clinical trial. Professor Susie Nielsen has received her PhD from Melbourne University before completing her doctoral studies at the University of Massachusetts. On her return to Australia, Susie took up a position at the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute, where she became a laboratory head in 2002. In 2005, she moved to the Australian Stem Cell Centre, prior to being appointed as an ARC Future Fellow and team leader at CSIRO in 2009. She became a group leader at Army Monash University in 2013 and a CSIRO Officer for Chief Executive Science Leader in 2014. She currently has an adjunct professor appointment at Army, Monash University, and the specific goal of her research is to understand Hema at I'm going to ask you to help me this easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And therefore, begin to address the changes and effects in Hema at disease. She has focused much of her independent research career, establishing models to identify where blood stem cells reside in bone marrow the cellular and extracellular components in that microenvironment, as well as the mechanisms through which these regulate the stem cell fate. Recently, she became the biology group leader in the biomedical manufacturing program at CSIRO, and she um, leads a team of nine who are all involved in the biological production, purification, and assessment. Two of these um, materials were the key, were the key critical protein in the production and purification that was key to our recent phase one COVID vaccine work. Thank you, Susie. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today and apologies for putting words in that you could <laughs> pronounce. And what I'm going to present to you today is actually nine teams of people. If, if you think nine people can do what I show you, then that's not going to work. So I apologize for that misinformation. Um, so for those of you who are aware of CSIRO, we're a very large eclectic national organisation with many different um, skill sets and capabilities spread across um, every state. And where do we fit into this and um, how do biologics fit into this? So traditionally, many people will be aware of the group of people down at ARL, or what was called ARL, that's now ACDP, which is where, you know, they do the disease preparedness and a lot of the testing. We are actually part of the manufacturing business unit, and I have to apologise for my voice. I actually have nodules on my vocal cords, so if anyone's doing biologics for that versus more surgery, I'd appreciate <laughs> like putting that aside. I'm not infectious at all, and I'm sick. It's very important because everyone's looking like I've got the lurgate in my mouth, it's quite embarrassing. 
Anyway, manufacturing consists of three different programs, of which one of those is biomedical, and that's where we, we sit. So historically, we have been um, involved in biologics for a significant period of time, and perhaps our greatest success story that people would be aware of is being involved in the development of the Relenza drug. So this really came about because of the capabilities in crystallography, where they were able to look at the influenza virus and identify a key part of that virus that actually is consistent across all the strains. And through work with a collaborator at a um, company called Biota, they were able to um, do some drug discovery work and actually identify a drug that targeted that section of the virus. And Biota went on to actually develop and commercialise that um, Relenza, and then it was taken up and licensed and promoted by uh, GlaxoSmithKline. So that was back in 1999, so many, many years ago now. And there's been other different uh, <coughs> receptors on the surface of different types of cells where uh, we've been involved in identification of the structure that's led to drug discovery type projects. So that's sort of one space in which we have been um, able to contribute to the development of different biologics. At this time, there is really identified of an unmet need in Australia, which was really taking um, our collaborators and people interact with um, research that's done in the laboratory and allowing them to go to phase one clinical trial. And we heard today about the lack of capability in terms of producing stuff within this country in the microbial space. And, and I agree that still exists today. And where we where we've really stepped into this space has been far more in the mammalian space, so in the protein space. So through the different teams within our group, what we can now do and contribute readily to is situations such as, you know, very early stage in terms of cell constructs and, and cell line development, where we're very adaptable in terms of generating what individual requirements are, whether they want to do mutations or substitutions, whether they want to do tags to allow, you know, for different um, expression systems or different purification methodologies. We do different batch feeds, continuous, different stables, transients. We really go through a process of optimising protein expression, um, isolation and purification. And a number of years ago now, um, we decided that we really needed to move into that sort of phase one production space. And this was enabled by um, building of an NQuest facility out at our Clayton site next to Monash University back in 2009, where we built two labs. So one of them is a microbial lab. And this really enabled uh, research in the microbial space. So you, you can't actually produce stuff for a phase one clinical trial in a microbial background at the moment. But what it did that allow us to do is do large scale um, R&D projects in this space. And you can see there's some examples of where we've been doing this kind of work um, in biomedical manufacturing, in non-animal collagens um, and microbial service testing, for example in food and health, in land and water with anti phthalene compounds. So we have a lot of varied work that goes through that kind of laboratory. More relevant to today's discussion is really on the mammalian side where we, back at the same time, we built a mammalian lab that was actually accredited um, to go to make product for phase one clinical trial here in Australia. So in this um, space, we can make um, milligrams up to kilogram scales. It's accredited appropriately. We have a variety of different bioreactors. We have expertise in terms of the upstream system production. We have the protein purification of downstream. We have um, QC, protein analysis. And of course, this is underpinned by a um, significant QMS. And it was really the fact that we built this facility that allowed us to take a project on that led us into the COVID space, which Funny enough, is somewhere we never expected to be. So a good example of this, and I'm sorry you can't read it at the top because of the, the sort of writing up there, but we, a number, back in 2019, got into a project that was being run with a variety of different organisations around the country. And I have to say that my take home from COVID and our experience in the space of biologics has really been that Australia has come together in terms of every organisation, be it academic, be it industry, be it government, Everybody has banded together and really just got the job done. And our example is really how it's going to show you how we were part of that, but it's a credit to every 
domestic and organisation in this country that we got there. So back in 2019, we started on a project um, with CEPI, which is being driven with UQ, where we were going to uh, look to develop vaccines for a variety of different targets. You can see there, flu, MERS, ISV. The critical part of this um, is down the bottom here, disease X. So when we signed up to this, we were identified as a rapid responding organisation. And essentially what we had agreed to was that if disease X happened to pop along, that we would turn our attention and very rapidly adapt and change and focus on disease X with a commitment to getting a vaccine for disease X out in the shortest possible time frame, approximately 26 weeks. We never thought that was going to happen, let's be honest. I mean, if I said to you we're going to live through five months of lockdown, if you have to be unfortunately in Melbourne or anything else in the last year and a half, we would all feel crazy, right? So Lo and behold, very short time period in the third end of the first year, disease X pops along and it's actually COVID 19. So we dropped everything. And how did we make a vaccine that went into clinical trial within six months? Um, and as I said to you, this was a, a true collaborative um, collection of people, organisations from UQ at the start with CEPI, all the way to CSL at the end. Um, we produced as in scaled up and produced the uh, material to do the phase one clinical trial for the UQ, what's known as the UQ vaccine, um, that you all have heard about across the news. So here is basically all the steps along the way that we, we did in that period of time. Um, I'd love to tell you it all went smoothly and there were no hiccups. That just wouldn't be true. We had a huge, not huge, but we had significant hiccups and a large number of them but we were able to address them because of the effort, as I said, from all the I mean, CSL came and worked with us. It, it, that was fantastic. At UQ, we had Sativa, we just, we had Doherty, we had people from all the organisations who really just jumped in and we all worked together to work out all the different things that happened along the way, whether it was protein navigation, whether it was, you know, how are we going to change columns to purify. We didn't have time to work this out. That's the whole thing about being a rapid responder. You can't do what you normally take you up to 10 years to get this through and optimise each process, et cetera. We had to do it in 26 weeks. So you had to run everything concurrently and you had to go best and make decisions on the run and change things and just make it work. Good news is in July, we started back, as you know, COVID really sort of started in January. Um, we went in our first lockdown, what, about March, I think. Um, but we'd already started this whole antigen design and selection process with UQ had. They sent it through to us. We, we did the sort of the scale up and we provided them with the uh, vaccines to go into clinical phase one, the trial in July. And the first patient was injected, I think, about the 10th of July last year. Now, I'm sure you all remember that it hit the news that the um, trial was stopped. I don't know if everyone understands why the trial was stopped, so I just thought I'd give you if you'd like, a brief understanding about why, what happened. In reality, the adverse effects were mild um, to moderate, so they were very favourable. The um, immunogenicity in terms of patient outcome, et cetera, was, was also very favourable. The reason that it stopped was because of the design and the initial clamp, um, the clamp technology, which you could use to actually design the vaccine. So, the premise of it is that they use a clamp to actually hold it in the 3D structure to improve the way that it's presented so that your immune response will be ideal because you're seeing it the way it actually is on the outside of COVID. That's like protein everyone talks about. But that clamp that holds it in that 3D structure had a small sequence of HIV in it. And as a consequence, if you ran, if you'd been vaccinated with it and you ran a certain type of HIV test kit, um, then you came up with a false positive. So nobody had HIV, nobody could get HIV, and not, you know, a large number of the HIV test kits that we used would come up negative. But because a small number of test kits would come up positive, and a lot of those kits were the ones that are using in third world countries, the decision was made to stop the trial. I think we've all seen, and talking about hype in the media, we've all seen how something is portrayed the day after this, 
Um, one of our key politicians made a comment around, you know, well, now we're giving people aids and stuff like that. So people make comments and trying to educate Australians that actually this is safe, you're not going to get HIV and that we could use a different test kit for HIV. It, if I personally wonder if it had been the only vaccine on the, you know, that was working, they probably would have report. But there were others that are fantastic and I agree, we can't be choosing to take the one we get, we should all take it. Um, but it, it's that. So where is that at now? Um, actually, YouTube's looking at it at the moment and working through changing this so that that program will no longer exist. So it's kind of a watch this space and we're excited about being involved in the future of where that might end up going. What did that do? Well, it, it taught us a, a valuable lesson. It showed us that actually if we all come together, we can do something in incredible time and, you know, even though it was halted, we were all incredibly proud to have been part of it and actually achieve that. Um, it was great to develop our working relationship with CSL and at the moment we've actually got people seconded to CSL that are helping with the um, AstraZeneca vaccine, um, both in upstream, Q&A, uh, QA downstream and in QC space. So they've been there since sort of mid-end last year and um, some of them are there to the middle of this year. So again, we're really glad that we could develop a uh, an increased interaction with CSL and working in this space and continue to work together moving into the future. The other super exciting thing that's sort of come out of this that we were going to, we were doing anyway, um, we can't set the title, but we are currently constructing a GMP facility at Clayton. And what that's allowing us to do is to go to that next stage of making products for phase two, phase three. So we, we don't manufacture for commercial, that's not our, our remit. Our remit is to help um, SMEs, uh, academics, people who develop something who want to get through that clinical trial process to then move forward and take it to a manufacturer, whether it's CSL, whether it's overseas or, or whatever. But we have probably about 40% of the way through the construction. It should be finished in November. Um, it's going to allow us to do scale up from 50 litres to 200 litres in the mammalian space or different biologics. And it's going to be accredited for both TGA, but also importantly um, for the US and for Europe. So if you want to do phase one in the US, you can't do it under the same system you can here in Australia, and you need to do it in a GM, full GMP where we have now is GMP life. So that's super exciting for us, and that's going to be our next adventure within the group is to have this GMP suite online. Um, so, I'll watch the space and I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susie. And the progress that you and your teams made in that such a short amount of time is just truly breathtaking. Thank you. You must have had a lot of sleep in the last year. We really appreciate you being here. Our final panelist is Dr. Anthony Stolers. Who is the Senior Vice President for Condiment and Gene Therapy Product Development at CSL? Anthony will speak about the capabilities and capacity of CSL in relation to large scale fermentation production of biologics and how it is applied in the delivery of the COVID vaccine. As a member of the RD executive team, his um, position is a key leadership role within the RD organisation of the CSL group of companies. And he's responsible for allowing the CSL group to pursue an ambitious and successful recombinant and gene therapy product development program that contributes to the company's vision of being a leading global biopharmaceutical company. He has overall global responsibility for the design, implementation, and delivery of, and of process development activities for both CSL's global recombinant and gene therapy product portfolios. Anthony's team is responsible for um, manufacturing processes for CSL's biotech products and the supply of drugs from early preclinical studies in clinical trials through to product licensure, the compilation of the technical quality content of the regulatory submissions enabling product launch. He needs more than 330 process development scientists located in Australia, Germany, Switzerland and the USA with a responsibility for about 15% of CSL's budget, which is over 700 million US dollars. It's a pleasure to lead a strong collaborative team spanning cultural and geographical boundaries 
that seamlessly delivers a coordinated and global recombinant and gene product development portfolio. Thank you, Andrew. Sure, And so, look, I, I, I thought to, to start, I give you a, a little bit of a view of how CSL has viewed the COVID vaccine development. And probably the starting point is just to look at, uh, to give you a flavor of the vaccine field. Yes. And the vaccine field can really divide it sort of into two, uh, two generalized categories the classical platform uh, and the next generation platform. And of course, it, for the COVID, uh, for COVID vaccines, um, both of those platforms are being utilised by uh, companies around the world. And of course, in particular for Australia, the next generation platforms are the RNA vaccines, uh, also the AstraZeneca vaccine, which I'll talk about in a little while, is a viral vector uh, next generation platform. And within the classical um, platforms, uh, the University of Queensland vaccine. Uh, was a recombinant subunit vaccine. And uh, probably the other thing I'd say about this slide is, um, you know, early on there are, there are hundreds of vaccines in clinical development and there still are. Uh, there are vaccines that are gradually being licensed. And I, I have to say, this is generally an incredibly positive thing. Firstly, it was positive that so many candidates were in clinical and preclinical development because what normally happens is you do five to ten years of research. You know, you discover it, you do five to ten years of what are the, what are the immunological determinants, you know, why are people protected, um, why are some people protected and, not, and other people not, how do, how do vaccines escape immune pressure and all, all of that sort of stuff. Because all of that was skipped for COVID. What companies did uh, was exactly like the University of Queensland did. Uh, they were working on a platform and then picked that up and applied it. So skipped the disease specific research and, and, and tried to take their platform and apply it to COVID. And because of that, because it was so fast, that's why you see some of the problems with vaccines in terms of how they deliver to patients. It's not ideal to have a minus 70 degree vaccine uh, for, uh, for um, some of the RNA vaccines from a logistics perspective. But that's simply because it wasn't development time. Normally, you would have the time to work all that stuff out. So, so it is good that there was so much effort and so many people working on it. Of course, also some of them failed, like the University of Queensland uh, vaccine. So, quick slide on CSL. The only reason I put this one up is because uh, we're often asked, uh, why can't you know? Yes, you could work on the University of Queensland vaccine. You're making the AstraZeneca vaccine. Why can't you make the Nova vaccine? Why can't you make the Pfizer vaccine? Mm -hmm. And I just put it up because, of course, CSL as a company, I mean, we spend, we're making, we made the University of Queensland vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine we're making at the moment. We're making them in our Australian R&D production facilities. And those, we spend about uh, 800 million US dollars a year on, on, on R&D. But our pipeline is so full that we terminate programs. So we have to go through a selection process, we have to go through this year of um, hiring off projects that we're not going to pursue. Also, CSL is, is a rare disease company and all of, our, all, of our, all of our research projects, all of our products, commercial products, are for serious life-threatening diseases. So when something comes along like uh, COVID or anything actually, and you, know, you, you want to, get it into your facilities, what are you going to dislodge? Fortunately, the University of Queensland vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, as I said, we put into our Australian R&D facilities. So we weren't dislodging commercial production of uh, one of our existing uh, marketed products. That's really important because if we go in and dislodge, for instance, influenza vaccine, uh, and actually, I, I, I said in the R&D Production is generally split between production of what we call drug substance, which is the active ingredient, the biologic, and fill finish. Fill finish is the process of putting it safely into vials and distribution. Our fill finish process is in our commercial facilities, 
And it is a real challenge to do that in parallel with getting ready for the influenza season. Of course, and, and you can't trade that off because you can't provide influenza vaccine. You, know, you can imagine uh, people with bad news when you know we had uh, false positives for HIV. But imagine the bad news if uh, my grandmother got the COVID vaccine and then two weeks later she died of influenza. So, so, so it is, it is a real challenge for us to balance. Um, what are we going? What are we going to dislodge in, in, in this? process. Um, so generally what did CSL do uh, to respond to COVID? Uh, well, it, it's one of those times, I mean, you would work for a company and sometimes you get lost in the, lost in the commercial side of things. And, but this is, this is one time where I'm actually really proud to have worked for CSL. We had a response uh, through our R&D network uh, sort of across the, across the board to COVID. Um, on the uh, on, on the prevention side of things, obviously we worked on uh, the two vaccine candidates. On the treatment side of things, we we looked across um, within our existing portfolio to identify candidates that might have an impact. Um, so we we formed a global alliance with some of our primary competitors to look at what we could do in the primary immune space. So that's purifying antibodies from people who are recovering from successfully recovering from uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, COVID infection, and, and, and to see if those, uh, if, if we could purify the immunoglobulin from those people, would it be detected if we concentrated, if we purified it, concentrated it, um, to either prevent, to, 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 to treat the consequences of um, disease. So those trials are going on at the moment. Uh, we also looked through our, uh, our biologics portfolio and one on antibody portfolio. Um, particularly interesting to see we have two candidates there. We have an anti 6 monoclonal antibody and uh, uh, CSOP312 is an anti 12 a monoclonal antibody. And just because of the way, the nature of the disease and the way that disease progresses in severe cases, we thought those particular candidates might have an impact on severe cases of disease. So those trials are ongoing uh, uh, as well for further action. Academic research too. But what I really talked about today, uh, an Australian focus is the vaccine work, uh, which we did in Australia. Um, first is the UQ vaccine and then the AstraZeneca vaccine. Yeah, the University of Queensland vaccine is, is a recombinant protein. Um, it's, uh, and I, I, again, when you have a lot of people coming to you and asking you to be involved in things, we generally like to be involved where we think we can bring something to the table. We have some expertise that will help. And in this particular case, um, we think we're really good at becoming a protein manufacturer, but we also had m 59 our license management, um, which is a fantastic management. Management is something you add um, uh, to a vaccine uh, to stimulate the immune response to the active ingredient. And in this case, uh, m 59 I think, has a really good smoking profile. Um, and so we uh, decided to, to combine it with the, the spike protein. And, um, and, and uh, what our responsibility was going to be was, um, whilst the phase one was being conducted with the material that was being made by CSIRO, uh, we were scaling up and manufacture the, the phase, the commencement of the phase three study, and we began commercial manufacturing. We actually made some pending analysis. Uh, in the period of October, November, December, uh, before the sad news came through uh, uh, that we were going to turn that to the AstraZeneca side of things. AstraZeneca is a it's a uh, it's a it's a viral vaccine, uh, so it's a very different technology basis to the University of Queensland vaccine. I'll talk to that a little bit uh, because what you've heard today a little bit is. Um, microbial production examples, prominent pro pro uh, protein production examples, and here a viral vector production example in terms of AstraZeneca. Very different production technologies. And the trouble is when people talk about Australian manufacturing capacity for biologics, is that it is, it is rare that one facility can do more than one type of technology. So you cannot do microbial production in a mammalian facility. 
because the, the microbial, the, the microbes have incredible uh, heat generation capacity as they grow. And so you need very specific reactors designed for microbial production. You don't need that from the native production. Uh, uh, the RNA vaccines. The RNA vaccines are essentially, um, you do a very small, you know, if anyone's done small scale RNA preps in their university career, if they did the RNA, commercial RNA vaccine production, <laughs> it's not that different. You grow up a plasmid in, in, in bacteria, uh, you divide the bacteria, you purify that plasmid, you linearize it, and you cut it up, you then conduct a chemical reaction uh, uh, to produce the, uh, using RNA polymerase, produce the RNA, and then you go through some stabilization. And, but it's, it's essentially, uh, a chemical process for us, as opposed to the very first part of it's a biological process. And very different, very different facilities uh, from a mammalian or um, So it, it, it is difficult to imagine how Australia can have the capacity to cover all of those aspects. Because, as I said in the beginning, to develop a successful vaccine, you kind of have want to have a lot of strikes on goal, especially in a rapid response environment. You just don't know what's going to work. Um, so, we were fortunate in the case of our Australian RD facilities. Obviously, CSL has two, uh, both in Melbourne. Uh, we have a, uh, a 500 litre, what we call our phase one, phase two facility in Parkville, and we have our two by 2000 litre, um, and sort of a phase two, two three commercialisation facility in Broad Meadows. Um, and we did both of these in our Broad Meadows facility. Um, so, there's people losing sleep. I know the production crew have already um, items that we filled. Some of them worked over the Christmas New Year period. Uh, some of them worked uh, 160 hours over that fortnight. Uh, so it's uh, an incredible amount of, of work. Bearing in mind that uh, we run a 72 hour fortnight, this is sort of standard. Um, so what did we learn? Uh, the first thing is the rapid response. Uh, everyone moving together is incredible. Um, so for our involvement, we went less than five months from when we started talking to University of Queensland, started talking to CEPI, tried to work out, uh, work our way, navigate our through, way through the, uh, the licensing and intellectual property aspects of the vaccine um, to uh, the production of first phase three doses. Um, normally, uh, if you start from scratch to phase three, I would estimate that, you know, the head of R&D asked me how long it takes, I'll tell him, to be honest, uh, um, probably looking at three years. So to do that, uh, to do that for us for less than five months, to do that for the University of Queensland and SIRA, what they did to get to the clinic in, um, in a similar period of time, is extraordinary now. Um, uh, as I said, we use our R&D facilities plus our, our commercial filling lines for the vaccine. Uh, we thought we brought to the table some good scale-up uh, around the common production uh, and our adjuvant experience. We leveraged our global teams, uh, especially our global securist teams. Securist being CSL's vaccine arm, our influenza vaccine arm, and then we made uh, 10 million doses. Um, AstraZeneca was slightly different. Uh, first challenge with AstraZeneca was uh, the facility that we had to put this, this in was our broad meadows R and D uh, facility. It's a recombinant protein facility, it's a mammalian facility. You design those facilities um, from a production perspective to do one thing: that's to keep viruses out, to keep adventitious agents out. So it's a complete challenge uh, mindset on our part. To think about uh, what are the consequences and how we could go about bringing a live virus into those facilities and produce a live virus. And then that's not just on our part, but then the regulators part, the OGTR and the TGA. It's extremely complementary. We had weekly meetings with both agencies during this period to work through what were the risks, how, what were our control measures going to be like, were they going to be suitable from their perspective. Uh, so those are really great. Collaboration, but it was a, a, a real a, a real mindset change. Um, okay. 
yeah, probably again, uh, the, the timing again, yeah, just this is this was a little bit different. Um, instead of SARA, University of Queensland, SARA, and ourselves having to work out the manufacturing process, in this case, uh, AstraZeneca had the manufacturing process, and we tech transferred that process into CSL. Normally, again, that's a process. I do a tech transfer myself in phase three stage to CDMO, um, so outside of CSL. We budget probably 12 months for that process. Um, uh, but again, uh, we went from seven months from the beginning of the conversation uh, with AstraZeneca, helping that actually the CEO of AstraZeneca at the time on the CSL board. And that's how the relationship started pretty fast. Um, but yeah, seven months to the first uh, production campaign. Um, at our target at the moment, we're in the phase now where we're producing basically, uh, uh, not quite, but basically a million, a million finished vials per week. Well, my question was really for Bruce. You, you had it. lots of good and bad news for us, but the thing about Australia's morbidity rate from uh, asthma, do we get that? Do we not dive into other things, or why is it high? Um, oh, okay. It's actually really multifactorial. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Only one in ten people have well controlled asthma. Only one in ten people fill out their prescriptions as they should. So the, the, the GP gives the prescription to the patients, but they don't fill it out. In fact, only uh, you meant to have fill out one prescription a month. That only happens once for the whole year. So if you look at uh, it was about four years ago, five years ago now, 2016, the bit of a cool change outside. Uh, went from 38 degrees down to, to 21 degrees, it killed 10 people and put 8,000 people in hospital. And part of the reason why is, oh yeah, no, I didn't have a prescription, I haven't filled it out, they haven't taken my asthma medication for goodness knows how long. So uh, there's a huge bit of, you can see that immunology is looking pretty cool. We sort of understand a bit about that. We have some pretty funky drugs as well that really know that they work. The medicine in between is the problem. So uh, it's proper diagnosis, proper phenotyping, getting rid of all the triggers, taking your medications as you should. That's the bit that we need to go for. Thank you, Bruce. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, I suppose the question a couple of you touched on is that we and other countries are now grappling with and the sort of sovereign capability is what's our gap? So we've got a CSL, we're right lucky, we've got a vaccine manufacturer with that to, to adapt quickly and we heard we built CSO is building a GMP plant. But what are the you know the interests of each of the panels? What do you think the gaps are if we're really to have self-sufficiency from an RD point of view through to manufacture and a product? I would probably say a really strong biotech industry. So we have a very strong biotech industry in Australia that is undercapitalized. And so the trouble is there's not a feeder, uh, you know, there's not a, a demand, a pull for new facilities. There's not, um, if you set up a facility, you, you know, you, yeah, it costs us, well, let me say, it costs us uh, nearly $10 million a year to run the year there, just to keep the lights on. So that, that sorry, the end of the facility or the R and D facility that are building that. So uh, you, you've got that depreciation at that plus the operational costs. Um, so if you don't have a steady supply of um, um, 
customers coming through. That's an enormous drain. Uh, and it's probably too much for, the, for a government institution to sustain. So for a private company to sustain that, you, you really need a strong biotech industry feeding products through, new biologics coming through. And, and if we had that, also we would you know, see the drain of those ideas overseas as well from a, you know, I've often seen from the French public as well. So, that's probably, so if we had that, I think, that's what would provide the, the incentive for people to set up those sorts of facilities. And, and multi-technology facilities as well. And I really echo what you said, and I, to add to that, at the moment, if only you're aware, there's a, been a lot of push for, well, why can't CSL be making all the other vaccines? Why aren't you making the Pfizer vaccine? And, you know, the technology is completely different. So there's now push to make a plant or a manufacturing location to make RNA vaccines in this country, which right now for the pandemic might seem fantastic, but one product can't sustain a company. So, you know, is it going to be just RNA vaccines? Is it going to be a full suite of microbial? Is there enough demand for that to keep it going because you can't run a facility that's empty? How's that going to look? Uh, you know, so our population is 25 million. CSL is making more vaccines to then to immunise us for, you know, how long? So, yes, we can play a role socially responsible, we should, for our neighbouring countries, but we're going to make another plant to make RNA vaccines or those kinds of microbial vaccines, cycle vaccines, yeast, that you could sort of start bundling things and thinking that way. If we're going to do that, and it's quite likely that it will happen, but where, what are we aiming at? You know, are we looking at just Australia or are we looking at, you know, Australia Pacific? Are we going to try and distribute the rest of you know, They're not going to go to Europe and America because they've already got all of that. So trying to position it, it's really hard. Our niche, I think Australia's got so much intellect and our research is so strong. And we don't want to see that be drained, but we have to be selective in what we try to manufacture so that niche manufacturing really comes into it. And trying to be smart and design that and work together and not compete with each other. And I think COVID's really brought that out in us that we are, there's a lot of communication of how we can band together to get that supply chain. Because, you know, if you built the, the, the final manufacturing, but you didn't have the big we fuel with that gap from the bench to that phase one, well, the manufacturer, the conversion manufacturers, they can't afford to do that little bit because it's too, <coughs> that starting bit is too, there's too many changes and process developments and it doesn't run to a time scale and it's very difficult, you know. Our clients, they say they'll be ready one month, but they're actually ready six months later. There's all kinds of things in that space, but you don't go into one facility. So you really, you've got that pipeline and you all have to fill the different gaps within that pipeline. So it's really thinking, the whole thing through about what we want to do and targeting the right type of facility is what I would add. Yeah, I, I so I agree with all of that. The only thing I think I'd add is even if it's not the physical infrastructure here, you know, we can't have like get we can't have commercial facilities. So you know all of those different um, you know product specific things, but that view to the commercial manufacturing from an expertise perspective and being able to tap into that early on for that early stage, you know, process development part, I think would be really valuable if we had some more of that expertise in Australia. So you could, you know, you had people that had done, you know, 3,000, 30,000 litre fermentation and they had a view to, okay, when I'm doing this at 20 litre scale, what's this going to look like at my 30,000 litre scale? What are my problems going to be? And trying to iron out those things earlier, I think, then makes that tech transfer to an overseas facility much simpler. And you know, I think just the whole process would work better. So I'd be interested in what others think about this, especially the commercial people. But let's just talk the grubby aspect of money. Um, so I'm a loser, man. GSK spent the best part of two billion US to get it from compound to market. So any company who wants to actually develop a new drug, that's a huge amount of money, unless the government's given you an order for the actual drug. And so that's what happened in the US, happened in Australia, happened to other countries, we will buy $30 million 
doses if you produce something that actually works, but here's the order for it. Certainly, that actually focuses the mind of the uh, commercial people in the companies, I believe. Okay, so some questions from the audience. We have another one. So, Anthony, you've got 10 million doses. Just seems such a waste. Can't you do something with it? <laughs> 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 I was going to say, there's a lot of people who turn up. Where's the announcement? Get it done in 10 minutes. That's what I'll do. I'll do it. Unfortunately, it's, it's not that. I want to know what's next. Um, what, what are you excited about, and, and what's what's next on the horizon for you? You've all got different, so many different broad areas that you're working in. Where do, where do you think the opportunities are for Australia? And Susie, particularly with the GMP, that would be fantastic to hear about the other. So I guess we think, and having been terrible with so many people, we, I personally think I'm super lucky here. We worked super hard, but we had a job and we didn't lose everything. And so many people lost everything. So I you know, really feel for that. If I'm going to look for a silver lining, I think it really showed what we could do in Australia in this space. And I think it's got a lot of people excited about the future, about other biologics that can take through and, make, and people realise you know, that this is possible. The government, the MRF funds, there are, there's a number. We're just starting to produce a, you know, a, a next generation type COVID vaccine for another collaborator now because... As has been pointed out, if we had the ideal vaccine, there wouldn't be a minus second. And in a long term thing, if we're going to have to do this every year, it's not going to be a vaccine that's still at minus 70 and take around and dry shippers. I'm excited about the prospect of combining the flu vaccine with the COVID vaccine. If we're going to do each one each year, how long does that happen? Okay. It's pretty well, I'm pretty good to see that's the next thing that should happen. What's it going to look like? Is it going to be an RNA? Is this how we're going to move to an RNA flu vaccine? I'm excited to hear that one. So there's just so many things buzzing around it, and it's exciting to get a work every day because everyone is excited about the opportunities and we're getting so many calls and having those conversations, exactly what you're talking about. People who we see we can really help educate the academic researcher who thinks they're ready to go to phase one but doesn't realise the Grand Canyon between, you know, I can purify it in this column in the lab. I can lend you the column. You could just make it. You can take it to phase one, and, and the Grand Canyon between that and actually doing it, let alone the Grand Canyon between what we can do and it's getting it to a manufacturer like that's itself can do. But everyone's excited about it, and we're all educating each other and, and filling those gaps. So you know, I think it's super exciting. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, no, uh, look, I would say uh, blue is a really exciting space. Uh, the flu vaccine has gone through some remarkable transformation over the last couple of years. This is moved from a trivalent vaccine to a quadrivalent vaccine. I have to say I'm not the best, uh, not the best data in terms of the need for it, but nonetheless, that move is made. Um, and more recently, the move from egg based production to cell based production. Uh, in fact, uh, we're building an $800 million plant in Melbourne for um, uh, cell based production. And the efficacy data, the independent efficacy data from the US CDC and the FDA, is that, uh, from a scientific perspective, somewhat not surprisingly, that the cell based flu vaccines appear to be more efficacious than the egg based vaccines. Uh, so that's really good. Uh, yes, we do have an RNA program in influenza. I have no promises though about whether that's uh, you know, gonna go, uh, gonna be successful. Um, but for me, what's really exciting and, and where Australia actually has an opportunity to play a significant role because the barriers to entry are not quite so high is personalizing this selling to them. Um, uh, this is a novice area, frankly, to CSO as well. 
uh, we, you know, we have a light storage asset for um, in theory B. So that's clearance. Um, and uh, and uh, some early stage programs in the rare disease space. And what's so exciting about this is it's it's, a, it's quite a uh, it's quite a democratizing technology in that uh, any academic with a couple of million dollar grant can produce, depending on the technology choice they use, can potentially produce and treat patients for a rare genetic disorder. The trouble is. That's a, that's a huge benefit. It's also a huge challenge because it's, it's a bit like the Wild West in terms of the robustness and consistency uh, and getting that through to a commercial product is a huge goal for them, which is why the handful of commercialized cell injury therapy products, two of them, at least in my knowledge, have not treated a single patient since commercialization. So uh, it's so there's a huge opportunity in that space, and I, and I, I think potentially with the right investments, um, mm -hmm. that that is somewhere where because Australia does have the sort of the, um, the intellectual firepower in the university system you know, to really make you know, to be at the forefront of the science of that, and I, and I think there are opportunities there to be, to, get, to retain that, which we sort of lost a little bit in some of the other ways. Um, so I just wanted to add a, a couple of little things. The construct of us being a biotech and a biomed country has to be taken. We have to change the way we think about recommercializing the way we spend money on this sort of thing. There's a really good example in a um, a very small genetics biotech company that was looking at potentially a drug for a genetic modifying drug for cystic fibrosis, that horrible condition where children are born with this condition at least, so it changes the mucus production in their lungs and they die of a really horrible death at a very young age. And uh, American CF Foundation had a bunch of grants that they gave to a number of these genetic companies, and this is one called Vertex, that they said, let's just give you $100,000 to and just to spur on this idea, but we own a bit of your company for that. We're just on a small little chunk. So we'll invest in this, we'll give you the money, but we own a little chunk. So Ivor Kafka came out and that actually pretty well cured CF for about 1% of the CF population. They've got a couple of others. American CF sold their little share back to Vertex for an excess of a billion US dollars. So we have, to, we have the smarts, there's no two ways about it, we have the smarts here, but we don't have the investment strategy. Another group of mom's got a breath test for measuring COVID. And at the moment, they've raised another $2 million of convertible notes out of the directors, they've done this, they've done that. This is a test that measures COVID in less than 30 seconds time from a breath test. And we just can't get investment. Mm -hmm. And the government, yeah, yeah, really, really interested. Yeah, go for it, you're doing a great job. Yeah, yeah. can you give us the order? And we'll make it for you because then we've got this. so there has to be a massive change in our view. In my view, as well. Uh, just on that ecosystem, you know, in the, the biotech space, I, I think it's a really good opportunity now with you know post COVID world. There's always been the talk about a, a lack of talent, particularly on you know experienced biotech executives that have taken products through development into commercialization, you know, and, and getting those people back to Australia. I think the world now they don't need to come back to Australia, right? You know, we have a a, a CEO and a development person, a commercial person in the US, you know, before COVID it was sort of video, you know, just phone calls every now and again. Now we're on Zoom every day, you know, it doesn't matter that he's across the other side of the world, you know, and I think we've probably got the opportunity now to bring a lot more of that expertise back to our Australian companies without having to send the company offshore, which is what we had to do in the past. So I think I think we will get there. Thank you so much. Before I thank our panelists, thank you so much for joining us this evening on this our first hybrid event. Um, and we're delighted that many of you were able to join on Zoom as well. The, uh, the next event will be on April the 8th, and we have a very interesting event, which with a, again a panel of ATSI fellows, we will be talking about the perspectives on the climate 
water, food, energy nexus. We have Tim Reeves, Tony Wood, Snowbarlo, and Rob Latessi who will be speaking at that event. Hope to see many of you there. Um, I'd just like to finish by thanking all of our panellists. They were all just incredible presentations. And one of the themes that came through was the power of global collaboration, what can be achieved even under really adverse circumstances. And I'd just like to genuinely thank you all for your contribution to Australian science. It really has been a privilege to be here this evening. We have a small gift for each of you, and I'm hoping Elvira will be able to find them. It's just behind the poll. <laughs> um, but let's thank our panellists with a really warm round of applause.